Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. There are signs of progress with COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations dropping while vaccinations are picking up. As of February 1st, more than 559,000 people in Minnesota have received their vaccine and many have already received their second dose. For the very latest on COVID-19 in Minnesota, including how to get signed up for your vaccine, go to the Minnesota Department of Health website. Well, since last March, as of COVID-19 cases were surging in the United States and stay-at-home orders were going into effect, health officials have been reporting an increase in domestic violence. To talk about this and what help is available, if you're one of them that, um, or, or you know someone who is in this situation, join us. We're very pleased to have with us Jen Palzine from Tubman. Uh, Tubman. Thank you. Thank you so Glad much, to have Jody. You with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's, it's actually a pleasure to have you with us. So for people not familiar with Tubman, tell us a little bit about the organization and what do you do? Yes, so Tubman has been around for over 45 years, and we provide a wide variety of services for people who've experienced trauma whether that's domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, mental or chemical health issues, um, homelessness, really that common denominator is the trauma. And it's people of all ages, all genders, um, all cultural backgrounds. And um, what are some of those services that you do provide for these individuals? Yes. And is it individuals or families or Both. a combination? Okay. Both. Uh, so it is safe shelter for people who are escaping domestic violence. It's housing programs, both on site, a youth transitional housing program for youth at risk of trafficking or exploitation. It is community-based housing. It's lots and lots of legal services, whether that be an order for protection, uh, attorney representation in domestic violence cases or other um, just highly um, high conflict uh, family law cases like divorce and custody, those kinds of things. Um, it is all kinds of chemical and mental health services for individuals, families, couples, as well as for people who have used violence, a treatment program there, and chemical health assessment, uh, treatment, and aftercare. And then it's lots and lots of youth services. Everything from prevention, we're in over 45 schools across the metro area, including right here in the northeast suburbs of the Twin Cities, uh, where we deliver a violence prevention curriculum. We also do leadership development, uh, case management, mobile home visits, all kinds of things, uh, youth diversion work for young people as well as their families, and then all kinds of other wraparound services, a 24-7 helpline, uh, support groups, workshops, jobs, education, finance, all of those kinds of things, a clothing closet, a food pantry. What a lifesaver like you guys are. Yeah. It's, for so many people, especially right now, it seems like even more so than ever. It really is um, astounding what we're seeing. And it's pretty amazing how here in Minnesota, um, you know, our inspiration and namesake is Harriet Tubman, um, freedom fighter and abolitionist, helping people find, uh, move from fear to freedom. And uh, here in Minnesota it has been really at the forefront of domestic violence work for years and years since the very, very early 70s. And in fact, uh, when Tubman opened our first shelter, we were the third domestic violence shelter in the country. So we've been doing this a long time. And during that time, we have really learned um, some things that have been just really helpful in terms of partnering with people who are experiencing this and how we can learn from them and really how this community comes together to spread the word and help people find safety. And I've been hearing from health officials as well as from you know, law enforcement too that they're seeing an increase in these uh, you know, a variety of ways, not just domestic violence, but other violence and trauma and things like yeah. that. So, and, and then um, I also was reading in the New England Journal of Medicine recently that they're saying how that they know there's an increase, but they thought there'd be a surge of people seeking help and they're mm -hmm. not getting that because they feel like the people that these victims are not seeking the help that they might need. Is that what you're seeing here locally as well? Yes, so it's really been kind of up and down ever since the uh, first stay at home orders came through. And so of course the things we were worried about was, were um, to your point, what if staying home is the most dangerous place for you to be? Mm -hmm. 
And really thinking about that isolation and what that might mean in terms of suicide rates, relapse um, for people who are in recovery, um, all kinds of things. And what we know is that um, the complexity of those cases uh, where people are experiencing domestic violence has really um, just skyrocketed in terms of all of the various things that people need, but also helping people access help. Um, sometimes we're seeing um, that definitely the need has increased, but access, even when we try and um, partner with community to make sure that people know how to reach us. Um, for example, you know, all of us in the world, I think we, we became very quickly used to technology if we hadn't been before. Um, you know, reaching out to our loved ones by Zoom and those kinds of things. Um, we know that we were able to pivot pretty quickly and start providing services uh, remotely through technology, as well as some of our services still face-to-face. -face. But the challenge is that um, even if we can help people by helping them access equipment or have stable internet and provide um, emergency financial assistance to help them do those things, we can't always help them manage what's happening in the background and, ha and what's happening around them. So they can't always have that confidentiality to participate in a therapy session or to meet with an advocate or an attorney and make a safety plan. Um, so those have been some of those challenges are how can we still be accessible to people where they naturally are and how can we try and reduce those barriers. I just can't imagine someone being in that situation and not knowing where to turn and where to go for help and, and feeling like they are totally alone. So if someone is watching or they know mm -hmm. of someone is in a situation like that, what advice do you give to them? How can they, how can they get some help? You know, first of all, I would say um, if you're finding yourself in this situation, you're not alone and the abuse isn't your fault, and there are options to get help, and there are organizations like Tubman all across um, your viewing area that can really help develop a safety plan with you, what's gonna work for you and help tailor that for you and your family. Um, if someone you care about, if you kind of have that gut sense that something might be going on, um, my first piece of advice is ask, are you okay? Um, because I would rather risk offending someone by asking and learn that they're just having a really horrible day um, or they just, you know, um, their dog just died or they're going through, you know, economic challenges, which, you know, so many of us are. They've lost their job. They've lost their job. They're, they're, they're worried gonna... about making their rent, um, all of those kinds of things. But just to ask, are you okay? And to let the person take the lead. Just by asking that simple question, you've sort of indicated right away that you're open to hearing about it, and you can partner. If you are a concerned uh, loved one, you can partner with Tubman and other organizations to help as well. So our crisis line is available to you to help you figure out how to move forward. One other thing that I would point out just as a, a small practical piece of advice is sometimes even if someone isn't ready to leave, they might be in that initial kind of, um, maybe they've summoned up the courage to tell you that something's going on, um, but they know uh, they're the best expert on their situation when it might be most dangerous or when it might be safest to leave. And so one of the things that I recommend to people is sometimes just having a simple code word can be really helpful so that you know when things are escalating and they might only have a minute to tell you. And you have a hotline number that people can call or contact you, and that we do. number would be? That number is 612-825-0000. Doesn't matter what time of the day or day of the week Doesn't or matter what time of the day, doesn't matter what part of, of town you're calling from, uh, we can help. And there's more information on our website as well, which is tubman.org. Final comments for our viewers. On they're watching that maybe in a situation like this and going, I just don't know what to do. You know, final advice for them. Really just again, know that you're not alone and that uh, you have the resources uh, and the strength and the wisdom to, um, and that you deserve, you deserve to be safe and that there, you don't have to do it on your own. 
there are places that can help you plan and um, provide that interim support and housing or whatever, whatever it is that you may need. Because every situation is different, but there are some universal pieces there. And regardless of the trauma, it doesn't have to be domestic violence. It could be any type of trauma or event yes. in their lives that are yes. interrupting their lives. Yes. And if we're not the right place, we will help connect you to that place that can help you so that you can um, not have to make a ton of phone calls or be on the Internet and doing all of this research on your own. Yeah, I just want to let everyone know that we're all in this together and that you're not alone. I mean, that's the main thing, just to know. Absolutely. There's someone there that can help you. Well, Jen, it was a pleasure to have you on the program and to talk thank about Tubman, you. and we appreciate that, so thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Stella Head, um, we're going to hear from a doctor on ways that you can prevent some winter injuries, so stay with us. Son, love is like the ocean. You have to tread the oh, waters. Oh, Dad, that's not the kind of help I needed. Jessica, will you go to prom with me? Yes. Thousands of teens in foster care can't wait to share their first with you. Hello, Dr. Craig Maddox with the Urgency Room. Glad to have you back with us. Thanks for having me. So, you know, it's that time of year, you're, are you seeing lots of injuries um, due to falls on slippery parking lots and driveways and people just saying they just went out to go get the mayo and they slipped and stuff. I have experience with some of those too. So. Um, if you fall on ice, what do you, you know, how do you know if it's a minor injury or if it's something more major that should be seen at the emergency care or the urgency room at? That's a, that's an excellent question. Um, and it kind of depends. I think, uh, the most obvious features of an injury from a fall that requires attention. If you've had an, ex an injury to one of your extremities, your arms or your legs, and there's a deformity right? Marked swelling or an obvious appearance to the uh, limb that doesn't look normal to you, you know, that warrants investigation, you know, especially with lower extremity injuries with falls and twisting the ankle or the knee. If you're not able to bear weight, even with um, tolerating just a little bit of discomfort, if you're not able to bear weight, that would warrant uh, being seen. Commonly, uh, as a result of falls, people develop neck or back pain. It's fairly rare uh, for a standing height fall to result in a significant uh, spinal injury as, a, you know, as referenced by a vertebral compression fracture or um, uh, something uh, even more concerning like a neurologic injury. But certainly if you fall and, and develop difficulty moving your arm or leg, that would be something that you would wanna be seen for. Um, that, advice about falling and neck and back pain actually comes with a bit of a caveat. Um, in fact, as we advance in age, right, our, our bodies aren't quite as um, flexible and it's actually easier for us to injure things when we're in our 60s, 70s, and 80s, as opposed to when we're in our teens, 20s, and 30s. And so, as we get older, I think you should try to have a lower threshold for being evaluated if you have neck or back pain following a fall. With regards to hitting the head, and that's maybe one of the more common ones that we uh, see people for, uh, a lot of times people wanna know if they've had a concussion and are confused a bit thinking that a CAT scan or some sort of advanced imaging of the brain is required to diagnose concussion. And actually concussion is a clinical diagnosis. We often will do imaging like a CAT scan of the head if we're worried that the injury may have been severe enough to lead to bleeding in or around the brain. And that is unlikely unless there are certain conditions that are present. So for example, as we talked about, age is one thing to consider, but the medication someone's on. So if someone is already on a blood thinning medication, uh, the common ones are like Coumadin, or also known as Warfarin, Eliquis, uh, Zeralto, th those agents actually are associated with a higher risk of bleeding. And so we recommend people on those medications that they fall and hit their head, even if they think it's minor, they should come and get uh, checked out because the, the bleeding can be subtle uh, and uh, present in a, delayed, a delayed fashion. And so imaging is often indicated in that instance. But other reasons after falling and hitting your head that might require evaluation and um, scanning from a standing height fall would be things like a prolonged loss of consciousness, uh, persistent nausea, uh, a change in behavior, um, 
excessive sleepiness, those kinds of things would uh, warrant an evaluation. Now, it might turn out that when we see you, uh, based on the mechanism of your injury and the symptoms you're experiencing in your physical exam, that we may recommend against imaging, right? Because imaging isn't doesn't come for free. And I don't mean just the financial cost, which is one consideration, but certainly radiation exposure from imaging is something that we're trying to mitigate against. And so there's some very good treatment uh, algorithms that are out there, especially around childhood head injury um, that the physicians and providers will often reference in their uh, shared decision-making with patients regarding the need for, or the lack of need for advanced imaging. Uh, but those are some of the indications around falling. And if I could just make one pitch that for those of you who feel um, determined to go get the mail or take out the trash, um, if you live alone, take your phone with you outside <laughs> so that if you end up on the ground, you're not uh, waiting for a neighbor or passerby to happen to notice you outside and that you can call uh, for the help that you need, whether that's uh, a neighbor, a family member, or even 911. Well, that's great advice because I, when I mentioned that I've had the experience and I slipped on the, just the sidewalk, letting the dog out, right? And right. then um, I hit the back, I went right on my, you know, I hit the back of my head and I had my phone on me, you know, and I thought, I feel okay. I was a little dizzy, but, you know, I got emergency care right away and the scan mm -hmm. showed there was no bleeding, but I did, I'm sure I had a concussion because yeah. I had some of those other symptoms that you were talking about. So it's, good, it's, great advice there. I was glad I had my phone with me because husband had already gone to work, kids were at school and I was by myself, you know? Right. So it and it's so, it's so, it's, it's so easy to do, right? I mean, it's just there. Yeah. So if you're going outside and you're by yourself, take your phone. Yeah. And I'm, probably no one would have seen me till the end of the day and who knows, mm -hmm. it, you know, bitter cold outside and stuff. Right. So I think also I was wearing good shoes, but I still slip. But any advice like on what people should wear and not wear during to prevent falling at this time? Well, I mean, I think, you know, commonly, again, it, it, it all boils down to, you know, we, we make those decisions as we're going to do something that we think is brief and harmless, uh, like taking out the trash or going to get the mail. And we do so in our house slippers or <laughs> Uh, um, sliders and put on our sandals, right? <laughs> um, I think it's just really important to try to make sure that you have something that has uh, a tread on the bottom, especially, you know, in Minnesota winters. And of course, we know that if it's icy outside and really taking a look outside at the conditions of your uh, hardscape surfaces, like your driveway or your sidewalk, you know, if it's slick with ice, you probably should stay inside because unless you've got spiked uh, footwear, you're really putting yourself at risk. So if you don't need to go outside, don't. Are there other medications that people should be aware of that could um, make them more at risk for having a fall or besides the ones that you already mentioned? Well, th those medications certainly uh, don't put you at risk for falling, but if you do fall, um, for sure, those are ones that we worry about. I mean, there are other uh, blood thinning agents. Um, Plavix or Clopidogrel is a, another medication that people are commonly on that uh, thins the blood. But I, I do think that, you know, again, as we age, our body's adaptation to changes in body position um, uh, become slightly impaired. And that can be true, uh, especially if you're on medications that control your heart rate or your blood pressure. So just making those transitions slowly between being um, seated uh, to the standing position uh, is really important to let your body kind of adjust before you head off to do uh, whatever task it is that you've aligned yourself uh, to do, whether that's indoors or out of doors um, is really important. You know, and, and if you're a diabetic um, and you're feeling lightheaded or dizzy or slightly confused or just uh, out of it, checking your blood sugar is an important um, way to make sure that your brain has the fuel it needs uh, to do the task that you uh, set out for yourself for the day. Are there certain exercises people could be doing just at home around, the, you know, by a chair or something to maybe help reduce their risk of falling as well to help that core? You know, you know, I think, thing. yeah, I think, you know, simple exercises of, you know, if you have the opportunity to lay down on the couch and then sitting up on the couch, you know, that strengthens those core muscles, um, sitting up um, on the couch and then standing and sitting back down on the couch. Those are, uh, all activities that activate the core muscle groups of the 
you know, your abdominal muscles and your back muscles that help stabilize your body as you make those changes, but they also work the big muscle groups of your um, legs and uh, buttock area, which are important for strength. Um, and just being active is important to help maintain bone health, right? Our bodies respond to the forces that are applied to it and being up and about, it's really, um, you know, excellent for a lot of different things. And you don't have to join a gym or run on a treadmill to get exercise that your body can benefit from. Really good advice as always. That's great. Good news and good advice for all of our viewers to stay safe as this winter lingers on here. So thank you, Dr. Maddox. I know that you're very busy, so we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Let me tell you about the toughest guy on earth. He does the work of two jobs but only gets paid for one. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Joining us now, we're very pleased to have with us Wiley Buck with the Great River Greening to talk about a restoration project to help Trout Brook back to good health. So glad to have you with us. Oh, my pleasure yes. to be here. That's First a great time project. being on our show, so thank you. Yeah. So very exciting project. You're the project manager, senior project manager of the Trout Brook project. What, what's this That's all about? What are you doing? Yeah, it's all about bringing a stream back to health, like you said. Uh, Trout Brook is this uh, wonderful stream um, south of Afton, and it's about two miles long. Starts out up in the hills on some private land, then goes through the state park, and then goes through Afton Alps Ski Resort, then back through the state park and connects with the St. Croix. Yeah, I was wondering if it eventually gets its way down there then. It yeah. does, yeah. If For anybody who hikes Afton State Park, it's that big, um, there's the big bridge right there on the main trail, and that's Troutbrook Afton uh, underneath you. Yeah, that's right where it connects with the St. Croix. So um, as some people may know, the St. Croix is in a little bit of trouble. I mean, it's a beautiful river. It's one of the nation's best wild and scenic rivers. I love it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it has a phosphorus problem, and that's kind of, you know, scientists have identified that in the long term uh, we might have problems with algae if we don't do something about the phosphorus. Um, so a study is done on where it's getting its phosphorus and Trout Brook um, was one of the major contributors. And the reason why is that while well, it's got an ag history, um, it's in an area with really sandy and erodible soils and um, at least in the section at Afton Alps uh, the previous owners, not Afton Alps, but the owners before uh, Afton Alps, they straightened it. They took this wonderfully curvy stream and they just kind of basically ditched it. So uh, there's this big long stretch uh, that's a ditch. Um, and we're doing work throughout the stream, but we've finished the big major project. So right at the parking lot of Afton Alps, we took it out of the ditch. And we were able to see from historical photos and soil borings and elevations where the stream used to go. So we brought it back. We got the, the caterpillars and the excavators out there and moved the dirt and then had a really great day when we shifted the water from the ditch into the wow, new channel. Wow, what an undertaking. Yeah. So how long have you been working on it and where are you in the status of it, the whole project? Uh, boy, the, these projects take a long time. So um, I think the original study was done probably five years ago. Um, and then we did a little bit in the upstream part, and then this, this major part, all the engineering and planning was in 2017 and 2018, and then 2019 was, was the real deal out in the field where we, we, where we switched the stream. So, so besides getting it back to where, it, what else are you doing to make it healthy and, and, and to bring it back to good health? Yeah. So we make sure the slopes are at, a, at the right angle so a stream can be a stream. So when it rains now, instead of all the sand and sediment just flowing into the St. Croix, it hops the bank and it gets deposited on the side of uh, the floodplain. And that's what it's supposed to do. So it's a, it's a dynamic system. Uh, we've got all sorts of native vegetation along there, trees, shrubs, grasses, wildflowers. Um, 
and then also there's a lot of changes in the elevation. Uh, if you ever go there, and I encourage uh, yeah, people to make do sure it. I'll have to check it out the next time I'm there. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of riffles and uh, little waterfalls and some logs and stones. And um, one of my favorite parts is just the soundscape of it. Oh, I love uh, that. Yeah, you can go on the on the footbridges and and listen to it, and it doesn't matter what time of year. It always sounds like it. Sounds a, like some beautiful photos that you can be taking too of the whole <laughs> yeah. area and stuff. Yeah. So. Um, are, can people still get involved with it? Is there anything else that they can do to help well, um, continue we, in that progress and stuff? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, absolutely. It's a, it's a little bit off right now because it's hard for us to plan with COVID and, and volunteer events. Um, but we do have money to come back in and, and do some extra wildflowers to make it a pollinator habitat. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So we're, we're holding on, on to that until um, that's you know, good to go. Um, and then kind of parallel to that, um, Afton Alps does an employee outing um, every fall too. So if you're an employee of Afton Alps, you look for your epic volunteer day and, and we'll be doing some of the same. So yeah. And such a big project like that, there are um, some partners besides just Great River Greening oh, yeah. behind it. Why don't you tell Absolutely. us who was involved with it? Yeah. So um, South Washington Watershed District, um, invited us into the project. They were a partner earlier on um, and they're basically implementing their vision and the Minnesota DNR's vision for the stream both for water quality and also trout habitat. There are a few trout that find it now but um, DNR is convinced they come from the main stem of the St. Croix. They get flushed out of Valley Creek or the Kinney and swim up. They know they're not, the trout aren't reproducing so that's kind of DNR's vision is get some reproduction there, make it a really high quality fishing stream. So those are the two main partners. And of course, we couldn't have done it without Afton Alps. Um, their corporation has some, some green goals while also staying solvent. So they really helped out with a lot of the in-kind and coordination. And this is good for all of us, for our, our health in this east metro part of the Twin Cities as well. Yeah, it really is. It really trickles, trickles yeah. down to us as well. Yeah. It does. And I really should mention uh, everybody is kind of a partner because uh, the big funding partner on this is the Outdoor Heritage Fund, which is part of the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment that mm -hmm. the voters passed in 2008. So uh, a tiny portion of our sales tax goes for that habitat, and, and that was really what was the bulk of the funding. So we all have a stake in this. Yeah, we all have a stake. So, so I understand that you're also, besides this, you're also working, I mean, you work on other projects, but another one that you're working on is the Wild Rice Project. Why don't you tell us about that then? Yeah, uh, yeah that's also related to water quality. Wild rice is, is really good for water quality because it takes excessive nutrients out of the, out of the bottom of the, of the lake or the, mm -hmm. or the stream. Um, and um, the interesting thing is it's an annual plant, so it's not a perennial, so it's real susceptible to getting disrupted. Um, Did not know that. Yeah. So back in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s when we weren't too good about soil erosion and, um, you know, maintaining water levels and, and, you know, ditching and things like that, wild rice really took a tumble in Minnesota. So. Um, our role as humans is to help that seed get back because it really can't get back to these water bodies that are, you know, fine wild rice habitat. Um, so w these are help to collect seed uh, from one site and bring it to another. So. And you have volunteers that help with that process again, a major undertaking. Yeah, yeah. we have used volunteers to help spread it and it's, it's really fun. You get to go out in a canoe and just fling it and it's usually on a beautiful fall day. So <laughs> I was gonna say fall is when you actually do it then. So maybe by then things will settle down with COVID-19 and people can do some more of these things that they love doing in yeah. that. Fingers crossed, yeah, yeah. So if they want any more information about either of the projects, they can contact um, Great River Greening then? They can, yeah. Go to our website at greatrivergreening.org and you'll see our uh, list of that season's volunteer events. You can also sign up to get on our mailing list and, and get early notification about um, other volunteer events when they're announced. So that's well, the best way. Well, great information. 
Great. Very interesting. So like thank it. you for being a guest and taking time out to be with us. Appreciate that. My pleasure. Thanks, thank Riley. You. And thank our viewers for joining us. We hope you'll join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone. Thank you.